Forty years ago, the American public was very excited about what NASA did. We were excited about them sending astronauts to space, then later to orbit, and then to the moon. Those who had the courage to take those risks. Um, unfortunately, seem to be very old today. I'm absolutely embarrassed that the average age of those that have left the atmosphere are as old as I am. And that's totally wrong. Well, uh, now our culture, our funded government organization that's supposed to be working on our dreams. They have evolved a nature that does not excite the public. We're not excited about spending billions to do a small amount of science on the space station. We're not excited by our major funds being spent for political reasons rather than for the technological path to get us to Mars and to get us to explore and to get us to do exciting stuff. We're not excited by spending funds that could be used for risky breakthrough searches to prop up uh, the space shuttle and to keep it to keep it flying. We're not excited that we have given up a genuine search to find affordable and safe access to orbit. Uh, and we have given that up. In a real sense, we've given it up by not having the courage to go out and try things that we don't know for sure that'll work. We were excited back in the 60s. We're excited, Conrad, to see us make a decision to skip the Saturn II, the Saturn III, the Saturn V. And by the decision to fly the Saturn V, all three stages live on its first attempt. And even though it had these big pogo vibrations that put limit loads on the payload, I was excited as hell that this nation had the courage to take the first flight where humans were put on a Saturn V, Apollo 8, and go somewhere where humans had never been before, on the very first flight of the booster that carried people. I was very excited to go to the moon with a lunar orbit rendezvous and making that decision and funding that hardware a full three years before the very first docking in space in Earth orbit. We planned a program and funded the development of stuff that was going to have to do rendezvous in a foreign body by themselves, and we hadn't even done it in orbit. I'm embarrassed by that plan that says we have to go out and do another several years of research before we can build what we should have done 30 years ago, and that is make a good competitor to Soyuz, something that was safer and a lot cheaper to fly. Why do we need to do research if we know that the culprits who are going to build the hardware are going to do the boring stuff three years from now? Why don't we just have them do it now? We ought to direct those guys who've wasted so much of our money that if that's all you're going to do, if you're just going to come up with capsules that go on your expendable boosters, for crying out loud, go and start building it on Thursday. <laughs> and don't tell me it's hard 
If you're going to tell me it's hard, you go back and read the history of the 60s. Because it's not hard. Yeah, it might be hard to do what's right with research money. I.e., go out and take risks to look for breakthroughs so that we can have safe access to orbit. That might be hard. But what you're going to do is not hard. And I'm surprised you even ask that level of folk to do it. It's too easy. Really, if that's all you're going to do. But I don't think that's what all we should do. The public is also not excited to spend money to fund a trip to Mars that is run by an agency that doesn't have the courage to go back to the Hubble telescope. I'm a taxpayer. You know, we have spent at least $100 million, maybe more. I'm not an accountant. Just to build hardware that needs to go back to repair Hubble and to let some accident board comment tell us that they're smarter than us and that we shouldn't take the minor risk of doing something that we've done before, there's something very wrong with calling an agency a research agency when they're afraid to do research. We paid hundreds of billions of dollars for NASA research only to see us regress over the last 20 years, throwing away capabilities that we once had to go to the moon and ending up with the only thing to fly, something that is so complex, so difficult, so expensive, and so dangerous that it has no promise for us. The safety of people that have flown into the, outside the atmosphere is 4%. 4% of the people that have left the atmosphere have died in accidents. It's only four accidents, but it killed 4% of the people that have left the atmosphere. And I'm embarrassed to note that in 44 years of manned spacecraft, the last 22 years have been far more dangerous than the first 22 years. Duh, is there something wrong here? Well, the good news is, of course, that once commercial guys do this and they do it for profit, and once it is successful and profitable, the whole picture changes. I'm convinced that investment will no longer be a problem if we do our job right. And that is go out and do the right things to solve the safety problems and start flying a lot of people. Because the biggest, most important payloads have been ignored by our government research company, and excuse me, our government airline company, NACA never did run an airline. NACA never did run America's only airline. If so, we'd have gotten, all of us would have gotten to this conference by car or train. I want to put things in perspective, though, as there was a phenomenally important period of only four years where we went from only, only one table's worth of people that have flown airplanes to thousands of pilots, hundreds of airplanes in 39 countries. That sprouted up. There was an air show in Los Angeles with 400,000 people in it in 1910. Two years after, the, after there were only 12 people that had flown airplanes. That sprouted up all of a sudden, and that's when the airplane was invented. Next slide. Kids in those days were inspired by that. Something that great and so far-reaching and so phenomenal happening all of a sudden inspires kids. Who was inspired? Next slide. Every single one of my mentors. I looked this, this list. I, I made this list up when I wrote something for Aviation Week about the first hundred years of aviation. And I found out later every one of these guys were kids that were inspired by the growth of that. Ne ne next slide. My real standout memory as a kid that really got me planning my life 
was the Disneyland Television, 1955. And, I, and the old guys here remember that. The young guys, you've got to buy it on DVD. In fact, I don't think it's even available now. You have to get it off eBay. <laughs> the Moonliner at Disneyland Tomorrowland. And that little show that they gave us with the suspense of what was on the backside of the moon. How many have gone to Disneyland uh, when they had that? Oh, I tell you, that was so much better than anything at Disneyland today. There was absolutely no comparison. But imagine what it did to inspire someone to see Von Braun talking about going to Mars at a time when it was debated as to whether there were people or animals on Mars. Holy cow. You talk about getting excited. NASA has screwed that up for us because they got close-up pictures that says it looks as bad as Mojave. <laughs> Next slide. Anyway, this guy, oh, there it is, the, the model. In fact, I believe that model he's touching was bought by Paul Allen, and it's up in his museum in Seattle. But I got a replica. <laughs> and mine is just as cool. <laughs> um, you know, I met Von Braun in 64. And it was clear to me that he was not one of us. I left that opportunity of meeting him thinking that, man, this, this guy is just not one of us. I met him in a room of about 30 people. It was a cocktail party. We were both getting an, an award at AIAA. I was getting a National Student Design Award. He was getting another award. Uh, but it was clear when I walked into that meeting, if I had never seen a picture of Von Braun, I could walk into that meeting instantly and know who he was. He was absolutely that great. Next, next slide. Boy, where's Kennedy when we need him now? Look at the time when I was a kid. This is when some enormous spurts happened also. We went from just propeller airplanes all the way to Mach 2 stuff. Notice that research, which this is, this is Mach number versus year, fastest that man ever traveled. Notice that military and commercial ended up having a couple of, of couple of airplanes that made a big jump too, the SR-71 and the Concorde. These two products went all the way through their life cycle until they got too old and rusty to maintain and got shut down and we retreated back to the same performance, military and commercial, that we had in 1960. Guys, that was 45 years ago. Now, go back from 1960, 45 years earlier, and airplanes were biplanes with fabric wings and wooden propellers. What the hell have we been doing in 45 years? Next slide. Well, one thing we did is what Buzz did and was, and was uh, key on in Von Braun. We, it was good that America lost the Sputnik and Gagarin competitions, if you call them. It was good that we lost them because it pissed us off. It pissed off Kennedy because he, had, he was a new president where the America had lost its national prestige technically. And he had the vision to go out and say, we're going to try something real hard and I don't care how hard it is. We're going to do it because it's hard. Now, where is that guy today? That kind of vision will never, ever come from Congress, never has. Don't expect it to. That kind of vision can't come from the, from the locals. That kind of vision can't come from Boeing. But anyway, it was a wild ride. Uh, Buzz was on the, uh, on the uh, first expedition to the surface of the moon, and he'll always hold that honor, and he'll always hold my, my enormous respect. And when I saw him and Neil out there walking on the moon, to think that someday I could say that Buzz Aldrin is, is my personal friend uh, it was something that was a dream beyond, beyond any, any expectation. And I'm proud to know him.
Well, the colla I call it a collapse because I really think it was a collapse that followed the Skylab program. We had an attitude of let's study it, but heavens, let's not try to build something and fly it. We even built something, made it ready to fly, and when we're chicken to fly it. Hey, what's with that? If you'd have gone out and made a smoking hole with the X-34 on its first flight, we'd have learned something about the investment. By letting it go to a museum without flying and propping its axles up so its tires don't get flat, um, what do you learn? I mean, who made that decision? You know who made that decision? Golden. And it happened just after a couple of Mars failures. Oh, my God. This thing has single string flight controls. We certainly can't take the risk of duh, flying it. What's with that? Let me tell you something. The good news is we got a hell of a lot better man there now. I'm sorry uh, for the other guys. But I have a hell of, I spent a couple hours with Mike Griffin just on his third day on the job. And I read his congressional testimony that he gave uh, in 2003. And I'll tell you one thing right now. I'm very impressed by him. I don't know if he can, if he can get what he knows should be done through the current bureaucracy. I don't know. I, I think his point is true that we've got the same amount of money that we had the first 16 years. NASA's had the same amount of money in the last 16 years that had the first 16 years. But the problem is NASA does a lot of other stuff now that, that should not be done. It doesn't need to be their role to educate and to inspire kids. Spending decades putting up schools and sending around old astronauts to inspire kids is not the way I want to spend my money. The way I want to inspire kids is to fly to space and, get, and let them know that they're going to be able to. Very briefly, we all know what innovation cycles are. We all know that they tend to be about 40 years with a 25-year overlap. Let's look at an innovation cycles titled Higher Speed Travel. Go. Cars displacing horses and trains, propeller airplanes displacing cars, jet aircraft displacing props, and guess what? The other cycle is missing. If Concorde had, had a competitor and if we'd have gone supersonic domestically and internationally, and oh, by the way, the shuttle, this low-cost reusable access to space, made its first flight in 1981. See where that is on there? But that cycle just flat didn't happen. Did it? Next slide. Here is the research programs for higher speed travel to expand the envelope that our government funded and flew. I'm talking about flew. I don't, I don't call the X-34 a research program until it flies. You almost have to kill somebody to have it mean something. It tells you you've made enough, you've taken the risks. You know, X-15 flew 199 times, killed only one pilot. That's almost as many times as the total number of manned space flights in 44 years. Well, look at those. Oh, we're back in the 50s here. Things that broke the sound barrier. The lifting body research. Things on the top, by the way, are, are essentially our airplanes. Things on the bottom are rocket launchers. Well, what's, what's happened? Where's all the green stuff after 1981, after the, uh, the orbital system on shuttle was, was tested? Next slide. Well, there was some stuff, but uh, we didn't have the courage to fly it, so I got to take it off. <laughs> I'll tell you, I looked at this problem and said, you know, I've got a lot of airplanes and I'm getting bored by airplanes. Let me try something. So we flew a 
an airplane, a research airplane, and showed that it could be a first stage of a launch system, the White Knight, and showed that it is feasible, really, and I think it's feasible at any size, not just White Knight size. You're going to see much bigger subsonic, probably rocket gamma turned airplanes. And the reason you're going to see them is it's the only way that I know of to make a manned space flight that's immune to the failure, uh, excuse me, it makes the rocket propulsion system of the booster not a flight safety issue. Okay? Uh, next slide. Well, things don't happen when the government does it. And, and you can put a dozen of your ideas on here. I put one, computers. It was done for artillery first, later for the IRS. But there's not a lot of activity. The, the, the y-axis here is just activity until we got them. We're kind of halfway up that line. Uh, personal computers were done for fun first. Then Al Gore came along, invented the Internet. <laughs> And you know the rest of the story. Next slide. Look for cycles in space. You can't find any. There are no S-curves. Bottom one is unmanned Earth orbital. Middle one is all of manned space flight. How many, how many manned space flights followed Gagarin's in the first 12 months? Five. Now, the Chinese flew in 2003. How many manned space flights were there in 2004. There were five. Same number as the first year. Three of them were out of Mojave in an airplane, the Spaceship One. I'm embarrassed that I had to do three space flights to get us back to the, to the rate of the first year. I'm embarrassed by that. I'll tell you a very, very good reason why is what I'm about to say about this slide. We built and flew the Redstone with a mercury capsule on the top of it. And for the first time that I got to look at that close up, it was with Conrad here in Huntsville. And we walked up to this thing and it had a capsule on the top of it and it's mounted there in concrete and the thing's only about this big around, the redstone. And I'm thinking, well, you know, this can't be real expensive. Why don't we have tens of thousands of these flying every day? And, you know, why don't we have these anymore? And Conrad, a tear came to his eye. Because as soon as we flew an expensive atlas, we never once launched a person on a redstone. Never again. As soon as we launched Gemini on a Titan, we never once flew the lower cost atlas. As soon as we put men on a Saturn, we never ever flew a Titan, an Atlas, or a Redstone. As soon as the first flight happened on the low-cost reusable shuttle, <laughs> we never ever flew any of the other four. If we'd have done that with airplanes, the world would have one airplane to be the B-2 bomber. <laughs> okay, can we have a renaissance in space coming up? Uh, maybe. I think it has to have an environment that existed for airplanes in 1909. A belief that, yeah, I can do this. This isn't just government that can do it. The courage to try risky stuff. You know, I didn't need to do some of the stuff I did with Spaceship One in order to just fly the first private space flight. There was an easier way of doing that, but that wasn't our goal. Our goal was to solve the safety problem. So we tried some risky stuff like carefree reentry. The goal of that program was to enjoy that view. And if you look closer, the, the view on the left is taken from orbit from the shuttle. The view on the right was taken from, by Mike Melville. Um, this was uh, taken at about 102 kilometers, I believe. Uh, the commercial systems will fly to about 140 kilometers and go down range two or 300 miles. Uh, that view is the same. The sky is just as black and the horizon looks the same. And uh, I have no problem saying that this is the right thing to do now 
is suborbital. And that's why we did this program to show, because we believed that we had solutions for safety for suborbital spaceflight. Okay, let's talk about my decision to do this. I didn't have a customer request. It wasn't somebody that came to me and said, Bert, here's, here's $20 million. We want you to build a private spaceship. I had to decide that for myself. Uh, first of all, as soon as I met the criteria of that third major bullet, am I confident enough this will work that I'd spend my own money? As soon as I was at that point, I found money just like that. Well, it took me eight or nine months to get a contract with Paul Allen's lawyers, but, but, <laughs> but he said, when I looked at him straight in the face, and I said, I think I can do this. In fact, I'm confident enough in this that if I had your money, I'd put it in this. And he put out his, he put out his well, if I had some money. I didn't say that. If I, if I had the millions, he put out his hand and he said, I'm going to do this. Okay? So uh, if you do the right thing, if you go out and, and put some goal out there, hoping that someday by doing some incremental stuff, you'll raise more money and maybe get to the goal. But if you are asked, would you put your own money in your ability to reach that big goal? And you'd say, nope. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you're in that position, and a lot of these small rocket companies are, if you're in that position, you deserve to have trouble finding money, right? Because you're going to do the wrong thing. You're going to go out and do a stunt rather than the right next research flight because your, your really goal is to raise money rather than to reach your technical goal. So I think it's extremely important, and I say this also to NASA, uh, NASA the other space agency. <laughs> I say that to them, too. Don't accept incremental funding to do little stuff. Define what is a worthwhile goal. Whoever pays you the money, get them to understand that it's worth so much and commit to all the money before you do the first bit of work. Because if you do that, you will do the right thing during the development program. And also, I told NASA that the worst place in the world to get money is Congress. I certainly found that, and I don't know how they operate. Uh, when you're working with an organization that has 435 people on the board of directors, and everyone has their own personal agenda. At any rate, this decision for me to do this required an understanding of my childhood and a, an understanding of the 60s and what happened there. And if I'd have looked at what happened in the last three decades or had an assessment of the normal way of doing things, there's no way I would have done that program. And I think that's why few have attempted to do that program. This is a plot of the altitude and speed performance of essentially all the manned airplanes that I've developed both at the Rutan Aircraft Factory and at Scale Composites. In order to do the Spaceship One program, I had to extend this performance a little bit. And this is how the little bit was. <laughs> I had done incremental stuff within that little grouping in the bottom. And for me to do Spaceship One, I had to go there in Mach number and there in altitude. By the way, that's the Mach and altitude that Brian Binney flew the uh, last X Prize flight to. 70 miles and, and uh, Mach 3.3 Mach something. The important thing is, though, it was just an airplane. Uh, and when I stuck my head in the cockpit before closing the door on Mike Melville on the 21st of June, uh, he was a very emotional person because he knew that. He was just a guy even without a high school education, but he was probably the best pilot I know. He had flown nine first flights of new airplane types. Uh, one of them with me in the airplane, the boomerang. You know, I wasn't going to let him try that alone, not in something that weird. <laughs> and he was worried because he knew he was going from that performance envelope to that performance envelope. 
actually we did fly three uh, envelope expansion rocket powered flights and a bunch of glides. But he knew he was going to space and he was worried. And the last thing I told him before I pulled my head out and closed the door was, don't worry, Mike, it's just an airplane. You guys know what we did on our mission. I'll skip that. We call these guys research test pilots after they have flown an airplane or after they've flown something outside the atmosphere, they are astronauts. NASA gets away with people that ride in the back without a window calling them astronauts. Uh, we let them do that because there's only 460 some people, 440 some people that have ever been outside the atmosphere. Um, next slide. Uh, you guys know all this. Uh, the big thing about the White Knight is it has all the Spaceship One systems except the rocket motor. That's the significant thing. The commercial space systems will be like that too, which means that you can give people the float out of your seat, float around the body, or around the cabin experience, and you can bring them down gently like a reentry does. If you, go, if you fly the Vomit Comet, you come down hard. You only have four or five seconds where you go from floating to now you're pulling a lot of Gs. Okay? When you reenter the atmosphere of subsonic flight, you spend 20 seconds from the time that you float out of your seat down towards your chair until you get to 1G. Now, with this airplane, you can float your passengers. You know, what you'll do is you take them up. They do a launch of today's space flight. So they get to watch the rocket fly the newest astronauts. On the way down, you take your whole crew, which is going to fly tomorrow, and you float them in a cabin that they can't tell the difference. It is identical cabin. That's the identical cabin space before. You not only can give them the full reentry G profile by doing the descending wind up turn, but you can float them and bring them down at the same rate that you will for reentry. So you have the very best dynamic simulator and it costs you nothing because you need it to launch a space flight anyway. That's our basic approach on the commercial stuff. Uh, next thing. Uh, yeah, next, next slide. You guys know about the spaceship and, and, and about, uh, let's go to the next slide, about why it jackknifes itself for reentry. This is extremely important. The only accident that killed anybody on the X-15 was related to flight control during reentry. It was extremely important to me that we could do a worst case reentry, i.e. straight in the atmosphere. Uh, worst, worst case. And that we didn't have to control it in order for the crew to survive. In fact, on, on one of our powered flights, uh, uh, just before the space flight, we re-entered upside down. And again, the pilot doesn't control it. The ship straightens itself out. Uh, the ship straightens itself out. This is huge for safety. Uh, next thing, we did have to develop our own uh, rocket motor, uh, regardless of the press releases that you might see from Jim Benson. Uh, we, we did compete our valve, our injector, our igniter, and the rocket science inside, but, developed, but scaled made a very difficult decision and patented a new configuration of hybrid rocket motors. And we did the tank. There was no boilerplate, no subscale, none of that. The reason is, if that ain't going to work, you want to find out on day one, not day last. Yeah, maybe it was risky. But damn it, that's the right way to do it. This incremental bullshit is not the right way to do it, especially when you're spending taxpayers' money. In fact, they think they have to do it because they're spending taxpayers' money, and they're absolutely wrong. Next. Okay, let's look at let's look at things that are next. First of all, don't expect me to show you systems or details or schedules or ticket prices or that sort of stuff. Uh, and don't expect me to sign you up. No, we're not going to be running the space lines. There will be competitive space lines competing with each other, and that's the right thing to do in order for you to pay the right percentage of the direct operating costs. That is the right thing to do, and I'm going to make that happen as early in the process as possible. I, uh, we do know that spaceflight really is too dangerous to fly the public. 
I think that the early airline uh, experience is a proper goal. The very first two or three years of scheduled airline service was a hundred times safer than all of man's space flight. A hundred times, not ten times, a hundred times. And without any technology increase, just some maturity, within three years, it was 600 times safer than all of man's space flight. And the reason it got real safe real quick is there was a lot of it. And you can respond quickly to accidents might, might uh, make them not happen again. Rather, our response to accidents, excuse me, the other space agency's response to accidents is, well, let's go out and spend another billion dollars. Let's have another 5,000 engineers work this. Let's not really improve the product and let's delay the program for years. How in the hell is that going to increase safety? It, it's silly. It's just silly. A business would not do that. A business would respond, do the right thing, and go out and fly tomorrow. I think it is okay that the first industry is suborbital flights. They will be experience optimized. Large cabins, large windows, float your body around the cabin. You have to experience op optimized because you can't go somewhere on a suborbital space flight. It's all right to be cramped, sitting in a space suit, crammed into something small, and go to a spacious resort hotel on orbit where you're going to spend a week or two. But it's not all right to do that to people that are flying suborbitally. I think the first industry can and will be high volume. And, and we are developing systems that have operating costs sufficiently low to meet a goal of about 100,000 people at least with this type. There's going to be others flying other types. This type can fly 100,000 people the first 12 years of operation. Now, kids' dreams turn to planned. I think in 15 years, every child will know that he can go to orbit in his lifetime. I took this presentation and showed it to my dad on the way here yesterday. He is, was born in 1916. And when the first airliners were out there flying the public, he was 12 years old. And he used to go down to the airport and watch these rich people get on board these transportation things. I mean, if his family would travel anywhere, they would go by train. And they also went by Model T. But, but to go to the airport and watch these things and watch these people get on, he was fascinated by the technology. And he told me he didn't really have a knowledge or a belief that he'd ever be able to do that himself, that he'd ever be able to travel by air in his lifetime. Because there were just a few people doing it. It was risky, yes. The first few years, your chances of dying when you close that door on the airline are about one in 6,000. That's risky as hell. You know, Buzz doesn't think it's risky. He knew it was one in 62 when he flew. <laughs> I'm showing my guess as to when we'll have real commercial flights and real military orbital flights operationally, what year that will occur. It's just a guess. I believe that you'll be going to resort hotels in orbit before there are military routine military operational flights that go to orbit. Now, I know some people will say, well, once in a while NASA, NASA lets the Air Force fly in their space shuttle and that's a military operational flight. Uh, get proud of that if you want to, but I don't, I don't, uh, I don't see it that way. I see it by the fact that when I got to Edwards, in 1965, and I worked my first seven years as a government job testing all kinds of airplanes for the uh, Vietnam War, I would commute to Dayton. That, that, well, I commuted to Dayton for meetings in an F-104, a Mach 2 airplane. 
I commuted. That wasn't a test area. It had been tested back in the 50s. We used it to, to fly to Dayton for a meeting. And it was just as fast as an F-22 or a joint strike. What the hell is that? I was flight testing the F-4, and yeah, I went to Mach 2.15 as a youngster right out of college. And I went to 50,000 feet, and I did spins in it and water. That was a big deal. And if you had asked me what we would have 40 years later, I would have thought, well, what did we have 40 years earlier? <laughs> and if you had told me no more performance, I'd have said, what the hell happened? Well, they said, well, we got better radios. <laughs> In those days, we'd get on our 707 and go to Dayton, too, for business trips. And our door-to-door -door time was faster than it is now. If you'd have told me that it would take longer to get door-to-door -door in the year 2005 than it does in the year 65, I'd have said, bullshit. What happened? Did we go back into a cave and just barely crawl out? Well, I'll tell you, for us to get excited again and to inspire kids again, we got to do a hell of a lot better than that, and it's marginally better. It's a hell of a lot better. Okay, what good is this industry? I've been accused of, uh, well, gee, this is just a, uh, a joy ride for business or billionaires, or well, if you look at some ticket prices, it looks like joy ride. Let's say joy ride for millions. Okay. Uh, let me give you an example: the home computer. How many here bought an Apple II computer in 1977, like I did? What was it for? To balance our checkbook, right? <laughs> what was it for? To say, I have a computer <laughs> in my home. <laughs> but was it, what was it for? The vast majority of people that used home computers in those days used them for games. They were for fun. That's all they were for, <laughs> weren't they? They were for fun. Did we question? Oh. This is just a fun toy for people that can afford hundreds of dollars for a computer. I, I, there was no benefit in questioning that. But guess what? Because they were fun, there were a lot of them. And because there were a lot of them, Al Gore was able to make his invention. <laughs> and because of the Internet, it's now our phenomenal research tool. It's our phenomenal communication. It's our phenomenal commerce. And God damn it, it's everything, isn't it? And in another 20 years, kids will have to be convinced that computers were, weren't here all the time. But the first decade, it was just for fun. We don't know what going to space is for. And we don't give a damn. <laughs> Because when hundreds of thousands of people will fly, and those people won't have to spend years at Houston being trained to follow a checklist and know they'll never fly again if they don't follow the checklist, you're going to be a hell of a lot more creative than the NASA astronauts because you're going to do it for fun. And you're going to figure out why we're going. Just like Gore figured out what to do with a computer, aren't you? But for crying out loud, you're not going to have the opportunity to even try to be creative and figure it out if you don't get to fly. And the important thing is that you do get to fly. I talked about inspiration of our kids, and I think that 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 is uh, that. I think I've said enough on that. The quote I'm going to give you from Mike Griffin is out of congressional testimony he gave in 2003, and he said, "King Ferdinand." and Queen Isabel, unless you are a detailed historian, you don't remember them for anything but their financing of the Columbus voyages. That's what we know them for. And that was 500 years ago. And Mike said that in 500 years from now, our era will be known for the Apollo flights to the moon, if our era is known for anything at all. Um, 
But let me tell you that ITAR, uh, their decisions are not based on what you would use as log logic. And it is a very big problem, and ITAR type of problems, I'm not just saying ITAR, but the kind of problems with technology transfer of things that have rocket motors and rocket like guidance uh, will be an enormous blockage to doing, uh, uh, we don't call it space tourism anymore, uh, private space flight. Space lines, doing a lot of that activity, even in Australia, certainly in Dubai, and certainly in a lot of places where that want to do it, uh, it's an enormous, it's an enormous uh, problem uh, right now. Uh, our focus will be to do it here. Uh, first, and get the industry large, and then, and then have someone deal with that, because I've had so many problems that I have not been able to move ahead with, with what we're uh, hoped would be agreements uh, to do things with, with uh, dastardly orders. Yeah. Uh, Grant Anderson, Paragon Space Development Corporation. Um, the 100,000 passengers in 12 years, I can do the math of how many passengers a year, but how many vehicles does that represent? Well, it, you start off with one and two, uh, but within that 12 years, you're flying, uh, uh, we, we run a lot of scenarios, but this is a middle of the road one. I believe that at the end of that 12 year operations, we were running something like, uh, uh, I don't know, 35 spaceships, maybe 40. That's not our optimistic forecast, by the way, because I really believe that there's a lot of, how many people want to fly in space? <laughs> you know, one of the things that, 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 that makes it so that these big guys don't give a damn that they have to pay $80 million for a booster is that, well, our payload costs $600 million, so you now the booster is just small change. Well, for crying out loud, they have to spend that much for a payload. There's some payloads that will pay to fly. Uh, it's not only an unlimited number that, that a payload is available, but these payloads can be easily reproduced by unskilled labor. <laughs> uh, I think government should do what NACA did with airplanes, not even try to build an airliner, not even try to run an airline, but to look out and say, what kind of basic research will the industry not do for themselves because the industry doesn't have the money or doesn't want to take the risk. And let's give them, and, and NASA, and that kind of money has hey. given us some propulsion that would take us to the stars, for God's sake, instead of running the airline. It ought to be doing research. And, and I'll tell you something right now, uh, and this is extremely an important message, I think. When I identified what it would take to do this, here we are in, in space with an airplane. When I identified what it would take to do that, I could identify not one thing that NASA has developed in the last 30 years that was helpful to me at all in doing that. I got my ECS from small commercial submarines because those guys don't have any money. And also, your life is just as important when you go down in a submarine as when you go up in an airplane, isn't it? Okay? So the thing is that uh, they don't need to be doing research for the suborbital commercial uh, uh, flying the public business. And my discussion, and I agreed with my discussion with Mike Griffin, was there isn't a role for NASA in this new industry. There might have been a role if the industry sprouted up like it should in 1972, but there is no role now. Is there a role for NASA for orbital uh, flights of the public? Is there a role for NASA to go to the moon flights? I'm not sure there is. I don't think they can do things on the schedule. Now, I think what NASA needs to do is, is to send it. You know, we were proud that Buzz went to the moon in 1969. We were proud as hell. But we're not proud that they can somehow do it again. 50 years later? I mean, what's with that? But I'll be proud if NASA sends people that look like Buzz 
ourselves want to be the ones going to the moon, and we won't need their help because they showed us how to do that. Uh, how long ago was it, Buzz? <laughs> Thirty-four? No. It was thirty. Thirty, almost thirty-six years ago. I don't see a role for them. I don't, excuse me, I don't see a proper role for them. They're too slow and they get their money from the guys who won't let them take risks. Yes? Alton, are you aware, Bert, that uh, in the mid-1990s, German physicists demonstrated faster than light communications, not just a little faster, but 4.7 to 400 times faster than C, which opened up the possibility for practical interstellar spaceflight. Why aren't we building, or why aren't you building a starship? <laughs> well, because I don't know how to do it. But I, but I would, I would, I would much rather that NASA took my, that took my tax money and work on interstellar travel than to work on what they are going to spend it on the next two years. I don't hire somebody because he's had 15 years working at Boeing, or because he has NASA experience, or because he already knows how to do these things. I hire them out of school, I don't look at their grades, I hire them out of school based on the fire in their eyes, and my gut feeling as to whether that person is innovative, will have the courage to take risks, and will work like hell on something he has passion for. That's who I hire, and I need a lot of folk now. I need folk in propulsion, structures, aerodynamics, flight tests, you name it. We're doing a lot of hiring now. If you meet that criteria, 